Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about how glomerular filtration and uh, more local effects at the level of the glomerulus can affect kidney function and cause acute kidney injury. So now you can see that we're looking at a glomerulus. And so in the bottom right hand corner, I put the Starling equation for filtration. And so this equation holds true for fluid movement across um, a capillary. And so um, because the glomerulus contains capillaries, it holds true for the glomerulus. So I think it's important because it helps us understand what's actually happening at this local level. So this K term corresponds to the leakiness of the blood vessel, so the leakiness of these capillary loops. And since the endothelium of glomerular capillaries is fenestrated, so it has large windows, large holes, um, it's quite leaky, and that's on purpose. And so this K term is higher than it is in peripheral capillaries. PC, so this is the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries, right? So hydrostatic pressure measured in millimeters of mercury. PBC, this is the hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's capsule or Bowman space right here. Pi C, this is the oncotic pressure in the capillary loops. And so the oncotic pressure is formed by plasma proteins, and this would oppose the movement of fluid out of the vessel. Remember, because oncotic pressure draws water to it. Pi BC is the oncotic pressure of Bowman space, but really in Bowman space, there aren't proteins like there are in plasma. And let's assume this is a normal glomerulus, normal human, and there is no proteinuria or albuminuria, and that all plasma proteins are retained in the capillary space. So uh, pi BC can be essentially ignored for this term. So for the glomerulus, uh, filtration is dependent on the pressure difference between capillaries and Bowman space, and then the oncotic pressure of the capillaries. So let's look at some numbers. Okay, so let's assume normal blood pressure. And remember, um, as blood passes through the afferent arterioles, these are the major resistance vessels. So the pressure in the glomerulus is significantly reduced from the mean arterial pressure. So um, assuming everything's in the normal range, the pressure in the glomerular capillaries is somewhere around 55 millimeters of mercury, okay? Conversely, the pressure in Bowman space, probably around 15 millimeters of mercury. And so this is the pressure that's opposing the filtration of fluid. What about pi C? So the oncotic pressure in glomerular capillaries, that's around 30 millimeters of mercury. So again, that will oppose the movement of fluid. And so if we put all these numbers here, so 55, uh, subtract 15, right? And this entire term has 30 subtracted from it. So the net movement of fluid uh, favors filtration. So it's a positive number. So it's a positive 10 millimeters of mercury. So this is the net effect of everything once it's added up. And so this is why um, the kidney works. This is why filtration is occurring under normal circumstances. So as you can imagine, once you change these different factors, that's how you have abnormal situations and opposed filtration. Let's go into some of those. Okay, so I've added a few things here. And remember that the afferent and the efferent arterial are they're pretty vasoactive, like they um, are able to vasoconstrict and dilate. And all this is uh, done in order to maintain a normal GFR. So uh, one of the cool things that the kidney does is auto-regulation, and that's what this graph is showing. And basically what it's trying to do is maintain a stable GFR across a wide range of, range of blood pressures. So the problem is you wouldn't want your GFR to vary according to changes in blood pressure. Um, as you can see that there are limits to auto-regulation. For instance, this is the mean arterial blood pressure Whereas a mean uh, blood pressure below 80, you can see that GFR is related to it, of course, and above 160, it's not good either. But in this range between 80 and 160, uh, your kidney is able to maintain a stable GFR, and it does it by uh, changing uh, vascular tone in the afferent and efferent arterial. Whereas, uh, let's pretend like uh, we're on this limb, I would say our blood pressure is getting low for whatever reason, let's say it's hemorrhage. Uh, the afferent arterial will vasodilate. The efferent arterial will vasoconstrict, thanks to angiotensin II preferentially acting on the efferent arterial. As the efferent arterial vasoconstricts, 
PC, P in the capillaries, increases, and especially if the afferent arterial um, is preferentially vasodilated, uh, we have better inflow. So that's one way to help preserve uh, um, GFR, even if the blood pressure is sort of going in this direction. Conversely, if our blood pressure is quite elevated, um, let's say we had a large sodium load or whatever other reason, we can vasoconstrict the afferent arterial to reduce PC, and uh, that will help uh, maintain GFR despite all these wild fluctuations in mean arterial pressure. So now I've added a list of things that cause vasoconstriction, efferent arterials, so sympathetic nervous system, uh, so circulating epinephrine and norepinephrine, let's say it's being released from trauma, sepsis, surgery, uh, can do this. Angiotensin II causes some vasoconstriction of the afferent arterial, but remember it causes preferential uh, vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial. Also calcineurin inhibitors, so uh, most importantly tacrolimus and cyclosporin, which we use in immune suppression, especially in kidney transplant patients, causes a dose-dependent vasoconstriction at the afferent arterial. Uh, hypercalcemia can cause vasoconstriction in uh, many vascular beds, but it can also cause vasoconstriction of the afferent arterial. And uh, you know, some people think radiocontrast, uh, like in, uh, for CT scans, can cause vasoconstriction. So all of these things, as you can imagine, if it causes vasoconstriction that's not uh, justified, um, will lower PC, it will lower the pressure in the uh, glomerular capillaries. And you know what this does, it sort of impedes the ability of the kidney to autoregulate. So here is normal autoregulation. And now it's almost like we, you know, we still have a steep curve, but even at, you know, potentially normal blood pressures and normal mean arterial pressures, we've now lost the ability to autoregulate as good as we once were able to. And so, as you can imagine, GFR is now even more dependent on blood pressure than it was before because now we have uh, sort of unopposed vasoconstriction happening in the afferent arterial. Now at the bottom, you've seen that I've added some prostaglandins, so PGE1, PGE2, PGI2. These are locally produced prostaglandins, and the way I think about it, their job is to vasodilate the afferent arterial. So they're locally produced to help keep the afferent arterial nice and dilated so that we have good inflow into the glomerulus. And, you know, there are a lot of circulating reasons um, and hormones that cause vasoconstriction. So we talked about sympathetic nerve activity, angiotensin II, uh, and then even uh, vasopressin can cause vasoconstriction in other beds. But we don't always want to vasoconstrict the afferent arterial, remember, because PC is going to be dependent on it. So these vasodilatory prostaglandins are critical to keep GFR preserved, especially in the setting of autoregulation. But as you know, we do have inhibitors of uh, prostaglandin synthesis and NSAIDs are one of them. And so very commonly we see acute kidney injury due to NSAID use because we've essentially lost uh, this vasodilatory effect. Um, of the afferent arterial. And so, obviously, you know, we've seen situations where NSAIDs alone have caused acute kidney injury. We see instances where calcineurin inhibitors alone or hypercalcemia alone causes uh, acute kidney injury. But the way I think about it is that it usually involves even two or three different processes going on at the same time. So, you know, something that's going to drop the mean arterial pressure in addition to some other thing like you know, being on Prograf or Tacrolimus or uh, something that's causing release of ANG2 or sympathetic nerve or, you know, something that's causing uh, loss of volume and low blood pressure plus inset use. All these things together um, tend to cause acute kidney injury that's due to a drop in the GFR due to a drop in PC, um, mainly because uh, many different things can vasodilate and vasoconstrict the afferent arterial, and we see this a lot clinically. So now let's flip to the other side at the efferent arterial. So you can see I've added angiotensin II, and so uh, we've learned that angiotensin II causes <clears throat> intense preferential vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial more than the afferent arterial, and it does this to autoregulate. So even if uh, the mean arterial blood pressure is dropping, in order to preserve GFR and keep it uh, nice and normal. Um, 
the efferent arterial will vasoconstrict and that will help boost PC. It'll help boost the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. Um, and this makes sense as a method to try and maintain GFR despite changes in the map. But uh, one thing that we do know is that we use ACE inhibitors and ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, to try and treat hypertension. And of course, what this can do, if it blocks angiotensin 2, so ACE inhibitors and ARBs will block this, essentially they're sort of causing more vasodilation of the efferent arterial by blocking the effects of ANG2. And this will impede our body's ability to autoregulate GFR in the setting of changes in blood pressure. So as you can imagine, any sort of clinical condition that will cause the MAP to fall a little bit, the GFR will be lower than it would have been otherwise just because of loss of this autoregulatory effect. And so in most instances, if a patient is having some sort of uh, volume loss or drop in blood pressure, and they're still taking their ACE inhibitor ARB, they tend to develop an acute kidney injury. And it's really due to the local filtration, uh, GFR being affected because loss of autoregulation. Now, a final thing to cover is um, obstruction. For instance, what if the pressure in Bowman's space, right, the PBC in Bowman's capsule is extraordinarily elevated? So this can happen with obstruction. Now, I know most of you learn, you know, acute kidney injury to think about pre-renal, intrinsic, and post. But um, the way I reorganize it, I like to think about the actual mechanism underlying everything. And really, the reason why obstruction causes renal failure is because PBC is extraordinarily elevated, and it's opposing the filtration based on the equation that we've uh, went over earlier. So what are the various things that can cause uh, obstruction? For one, um, the way I think about it, I just go from the outside in. And so the problem at the urethra can cause obstruction. At the prostate, uh, at the bladder, you could have bladder out obstruction or some other problem. And then at the ureter, you could have a ureteral blockage or obstruction, either intrinsic or extrinsic compression. And then the other thing to consider is tubular obstruction within the kidney. So uh, some drugs can do this. So acyclovir, methotrexate sulfonamides, ciprofloxacin, indinavir, which is an old protease inhibitor, um, and then uh, some of the components that can also cause nephrolithiasis. Imagine if uh, they crystallize within tubules, they will cause tubular obstruction and impede GFR. So uh, calcium phosphate crystals, oxalate crystals, and then urate crystals, uh, like you could see with tumor lysis syndrome. So uh, these are some of the things that have been known to cause tubular obstruction. And just consider uh, this entire differential uh, when you're working up the patient with acute kidney injury. Um, it obviously involves, um, you know, understanding the clinical scenario, uh, using your exam to understand blood pressure, uh, hydration status, and volume status, as well as understanding what medications the patient's taking uh, and figuring out how that factors into filtration at the level of the glomerulus.